Hey guys, this is going to be your economics lesson for uh, Wednesday, April 8th, all right, for the week of April 6th. Um, we are going to be looking at chapter 5, section 2. It starts on page 55 and goes through page 57, all right, so you do need to make sure you write down all of the vocabulary. Okay, you need to write it down. I want to make sure that you do write those down so that you can at least get these words, get their definitions up into your brain so that you at least have some familiarity with the words and the concepts that are located within these words. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Chapter 5, Section 2, Government Spending. The government spends money raised by taxes on public goods and services. In this section, you will learn about some of the things the government spends money on. Our vocabulary words are budget, a plan for saving and spending. Discretionary spending is a spending category that budget planners can make choices about. Entitlement programs are social programs for people who meet certain requirements. Mandatory spending spending is money that must be spent on certain things according to the law. And national debt is the money that the federal government owes to various entities. Okay. <clears throat> the federal gover government has more than $2 trillion a year to spend. Each year the federal government comes up with its budget for the year. A budget is a plan for savings and spending. The federal government's budget is divided into two categories, mandatory spending and discretionary spending. Okay, So some of the mandatory spending that the government has to do is going to go to schools, it's going to go to um, road projects, you know, keeping up like the interstates and different things like that. Um, Discretionary spending, uh, well, uh, I'm sorry, a certain element of the mandatory spending is going to be um, with the, the military. There will be a percentage of that that is mandatory that they need to spend to upkeep for our national defense. Um, there's several other things that, that would fall into the mandatory spending category. Uh, off the top of my head, I'm not able to think of them right now. Okay, but discretionary spending is going to be things like, um, you know, if special projects come up or if there's um, a certain, you know, honestly, there's part of the discretionary spending would be something like what's going on right now. So if you have like a uh, national emergency or something like that, there will be a portion of that discretionary spending, spending budget that will be set aside for that. And then they will actually have some of the mandatory spending that is set aside for national emergencies and things that go to the agencies like FEMA, um, which is the Federal uh, Emergency Management Agency. Um, and so that is the way that the spending breaks down. It really is into those two categories. You have mandatory spending and you have discretionary spending. Okay, So the mandatory spending, according to the law, some money must be spent on certain things. Lawmakers decide ahead of time that a certain amount of money must be, must be spent on these things. For example, a certain amount of money must be spent each year to pay for interest on the national debt. The national debt is the money the federal government owes. Okay, And uh, yeah, the, the, our national debt is huge. Okay, Our, our national debt is rolling into the trillions of dollars. Um, the chances of it being repaid uh, are slim to non-existent, and that really does present some very interesting issues. And so, uh, like with the relief package that they just passed, as far as for the the virus that's going around, um, that literally is going to be something that contributes to our overall national debt. And there are some issues regarding that. That's why there were certain people who were a little trepidatious about passing that bill and um, again these are things that they, they need to be discussed and they need to be looked at um, because when you throw a country into debt 
what happens is when eventually if somebody comes and wants that debt to be repaid and you don't have the ability to repay it, it can really end up wreaking havoc, one, on the economic system, and two, it can actually lead to much dire consequences like wars. Okay, so the the federal debt is not just this little issue. It, it is something that really matters, and it does need to be taken seriously. And right now, with the amount of spending we do almost every single year, the budget that is drawn up is actually more than the money that they bring in. And so they continue to go farther and farther into debt, right? And that, that really is an issue, right? there. It, it's become such an issue that there's a thing called deficit spending or deficit politics that has arisen because our budget is always operating in a deficit which means we continue to go into debt right and so it is a big deal and there are lots of people out there who are very concerned about it and recognize the the dangers that carrying that amount of debt really does present to our country and then as a result to us, the, the citizens of that country, all right? So it is something you need to be aware of and uh, th that you want to make sure and pay attention to as you get older, especially as you move on and you start getting jobs and you're paying taxes and you're seeing exactly how that money is spent, right? Paying attention to what's being done to try to minimize the national debt is a big deal. The rest of the mandatory spending budget is spent on entitlement programs, okay? So the most common, okay, entitlement programs that the government has is going to be Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Those are the three biggest of the entitlement programs, okay? Social Security, we kind of talked about last week. Uh, that's the program that is for people who um, reach retirement age. They've been paying into the Social Security plan. Um, when they retire, you then get a set amount of money each month based upon the money that you've put into the program. Um, and honestly, one of the reasons that the Social Security program is facing a decent amount of strain just has to do with the fact that as we've advanced technologically, right, the, the life expectancy or the amount of time, the amount of years that somebody is going to be alive, that has increased. And as that's increased, you now have more and more people who are living to be older and older, and as they live to be older and older, they keep pulling out of the Social Security program when the Social Security program, as it was designed when it first started, it didn't take into account the, the really kind of rapid growth in the life expectancy due to advancements in medicine and technology, okay? And so that's one of the reasons why Social Security is one of the biggest of the entitlement programs, okay? Medicare and Medicaid, those are kind of their insurance programs. Medicare is for individuals who I believe are 65 and older, and that it's like a health insurance that's provided by the government. Um, I'm sure if you, you know, kind of been paying attention to some of the things that, that swirl around politics, especially at this time of year, you've heard of the people who are in favor of a nationalized insurance program or Medicare for all. Um, what they're wanting to do with that program is take Medicare instead of allowing it to be something that's just for people who are 65 plus, they want that to be something that every American citizen can take advantage of. Um, the only thing with that is paying for that, right? You don't ever truly get something for free, right? There is going to be a cost associated with the service that you receive in one way or another. And so those services are going to need to be paid for, right? And while it's it's something that makes us, you know, feel good and, and, and you know, feel, you know, warm and fuzzy inside when you think that you're getting free medical insurance, right? The fact of the matter is it's not free. Um, it is going to be paid for by somebody, and that is going to be paid for, generally speaking, through taxes. And the only way they can do that is to raise taxes to such an extent that, like I talked about last week with your taxes, um, you could literally see tax rates reaching up into the 70 and 80 percent rate in order to pay for a program such as Medicare for all. Okay, and then Medicaid. Medicaid is the same. It, it, it's an insurance program, but that generally tends to be geared towards children and people who are in um, the lower income bracket, where they they truly do not have enough money to pay for their own insurance. Okay. 
And so that's what Medicaid is. And so those three programs, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, those are the three biggest of the entitlement programs that mandatory spending where that, that money must be spent on those programs, okay? The largest category of federal spending is Social Security. Okay. The Social Security programs pay monthly benefits to over 45 million people. Okay. Medicare pays for hospital care and medical services for people over the age of 65 and older. It also pays medical bills for people who have certain disabilities and diseases. Over 36 million people are covered by Medicare. Okay. And so just when, when we look at those numbers, that really is something to, to kind of take into consideration. So based on the most recent census data, the United States has a population of somewhere around 370 million people, okay? 36 million of those people are on Medicare, right? And at, even as, you know, as we speak, okay, Medicare itself, just with 36 million people on it, is having issues with their ability to fund and pay for all of those 36 million people who are receiving Medicare services, right? So imagine what that would be like if all of a sudden you make Medicare for all, and now you have, let's say, you know, again, 370 million people, right? Imagine the amount of money that would be required to put 370 million people on Medicare, okay? That's a lot of money, and that, that's gonna require an incredible amount of tax, and so, while again, it, it's nice to think that, that you could get health insurance and those kinds of things for free, it really isn't free. And so when you think about the fact of having 370 million people on a program that as of right now is having a hard time paying for 36 million people, right? Just think about the, the mathematical and just, the, just from a numbers perspective, how difficult and what that would really take to get all 370 million people on Medicare, okay? It, like I said, guys, it, it is, it's, I'm not saying one way or the other is right or wrong. I'm simply saying these are things that need to be thought about. You need to look at these issues critically and you need to really consider what is the best option. You know, you, you have to really kind of put aside some of your, your selfish self-interest and the desire to be able to have something like a healthcare program that is completely paid for and, and understand that it is going to be paid for one way or the other and what kind of a burden are you putting on people to try to pay for these programs, okay? It is something that needs to be talked about, right? And, and depending upon if you can come up with a way, if they come up with a plan and a way to make it work, that's fantastic. Um, but it, it's something that does need to be looked at and it needs to be considered seriously. And just because you ask those questions and just because you say, you know, this is something that we need to consider and we really do need to do the math and see exactly how much money it's going to take to pay for those things, that's not somebody who's being this hateful and, and uncaring person. That's somebody who understands reality. And understands that no matter what, okay, you have to pay for these programs. You need to have money to pay for these programs. And if you don't have the money to pay for the program, right, the program isn't going to last very long. And honestly, this is one of the things. This is why when you look at countries like Venezuela, one of the issues that they're having there, right, is they have all of these mandated social programs, okay, such as a national health care, different things like that. And they don't have the money to pay for them. And now that they don't have the money to pay for them, there is no competition. There is no private business, pro private sector companies that are able to come in and give people options for what they can pay for. And, and so now you have a whole group of people who aren't able to pay for or receive any services because there just isn't the money to pay for them. Okay. So again, these are not just simple cut and dry issues. A lot of times, especially this time of year, you'll hear politicians talking about these things like they're just simplistic, cut and dry, oh, we're just going to give more money to Medicare. We're just going to put more money in it. Okay, well, that's all well and good. Okay, but how are you going to put more money in it? What exactly are you going to do? What specific steps are you going to take to put more money into these programs? 
And if you don't have a, a valid and rational and actually doable way of putting the money into those programs, you need to take a hard look at whether or not you're going to be able to continue these programs or not just continue them, but spread them out and actually start giving them to more and more people. Okay, so it is something that needs to be looked at. It's something that needs to be discussed. It needs to be debated. It does need people on both sides of the argument so that as they go back and forth, you can hopefully come to a reasonable solution that lies somewhere in the middle and you're able to actually come up with a solution that's workable. Okay, and so that's why it is. It's so important so many times when people look at these issues, there's so many emotions and there's so many different things that are connected to these issues that sometimes people have a hard time putting their feelings aside and understanding we need to come to a solution that's actually workable, right? We can come up with all of these pie-in-the-sky solutions that sound really good and are going to make you feel really good and you'll go to bed and you can wrap yourself up in it like it's a warm blanket and put your thumb in your mouth and start sucking it and feel all kinds of good about it because mommy and daddy and, and, and big daddy government's going to take care of you, okay? But if you don't actually have the funds, if you don't have the means to make it happen, then all of those pie-in-the-sky promises, that's all they are. They're just pie-in-the-sky. They're just words. They aren't ever going to come to fruition. And so you need to have a doable, a workable plan. Because if you don't, right, you're really going to be setting people up for a whole lot of misery. Okay, And so you need to make sure that these issues are debated in a rational, well thought out way so that we can actually come to workable conclusions about how these programs actually should be managed, okay? Medicare pays for hospital care and medical services for people age 65 and over. Oh, sorry, I already read this, but I'm just going to do it. It also pays for medical bills for people who have certain disabilities and diseases. Over 36 million people are covered by Medicare. Medicaid is an entitled entitlement program that benefits the poor in the United States. Medicaid pays for medical care for low-income families, certain people with disabilities and elderly people in nursing homes. Medicaid serves over 27 million people. So when you look at Medicaid and Medicare combined, you're talking about 63 million people. So again, like let's just do some math. If we have 63 million and we have 370 million people in the country, that literally is only 17%, okay? 17% of the overall population who is on these programs, okay? If we're having a hard time funding and making these programs workable with only 17% of the population taking advantage of them, how in the world are you going to do it when you have 100% of the population taking advantage of them? Okay? And again, that's not being mean. That's, that's not like saying that these programs are bad. They're great. You know, I, absolutely. You know, one of the biggest things in Scripture that Jesus in, in the Old Testament, all throughout Scripture, it talks about is taking care of the poor, taking care of the widows, taking care of the orphans, taking care of people who cannot take care of themselves. So I am all for some kind of system that is able to take care of people who do not have the ability to take care of themselves. That is great, right? But we have to have a system that works. Because if we don't have a system that works, you're going to take all of these people who are, are not able to take care of themselves, who are already in difficult situations, who become reliant upon the government to take care of these things, when all of a sudden, if the money runs out and there's no way to do it, all of a sudden these people have nothing. There is no way to take care of them. And that's not good, right? We need to have a plan. We need to have something that's actually workable, something that's actually doable, so those people who really need these services are going to actually be taken care of, right? And it's not going to be just on a limited basis. It's something that's going to work and it's going to be workable into the future. It'll be feasible. You can actually ca cause it to be financially solvent, right? And so it's a really big deal, right? And it's not being heartless or careless when you think we need to look at and try to find a way to do these things better. Because the per current program, like I said, we're talking about 63 million people, a 17% of the population, okay? And if 
it's only 17%, right? We really, and, and we have a hard time paying for that. The people who are saying we need to give this kind of thing to everybody, right? They really haven't taken a look at the numbers. We've got to figure out how to pay for it first, how to make it work first before you start giving these things out like they're candy, okay? Going on to page 56, discretionary spending. Discretionary spending is the spending category that federal budget planners can make choices about. About half of the federal government's discretionary funds are spent on defense. Okay, so again, there is a certain amount of money when it comes to that discretionary. So the majority of money that is spent on the, the armed forces is discretionary. There are as there is a certain sp percentage of that funding that is actually mandatory that you have to spend that you you need to spend on um, certain defense elements. Okay, but the majority of it is discretionary. The Department of Defense spends most of the defense budget. It pays for military equipment like weapons, tanks, battleships, and airplanes. The defense budget also pays the salaries of the servicemen and service women in the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. It also pays the salaries of civilians who work for the armed forces. The defense budget also pays for the maintenance of military bases. The rest of discretionary spend of the discretionary spending budget goes to things like education, scientific research, national parks and monuments, law enforcement, environmental cleanup, housing, transportation, disaster aid, and foreign aid. So if you just look at that list, right, there's a whole lot of things that our federal income taxes are having to pay for. Right now, again, even though it's all discretionary, right? It's one of those things. Once you start funding, right, something like the national parks or funding housing or, or funding environmental programs, right, you then develop people who you have people who have jobs. You have people who are dependent upon those things. And so then there's, there's a sense of obligation to continue paying for those things. And so that is why, guys, again, kind of like I was saying with the Medicare, Medicaid thing. It needs to be something that is well thought out. It needs to be something that is looked at critically, that people examine so that they can come up with the best way to deal with these discretionary funds, to see what is the, what are the most essential programs, right? So right off the bat, right, defense and education are huge. If we don't have a national defense, if we don't have a way to defend ourselves, okay, that could cause some real problems. And also, if we don't educate our population, again, something I tell you guys over and over again, guys, right? A dumb population is an easily controlled population. Educating our population is a big deal, right? And I'm not saying that the public system does a great job, and that's one of the biggest complaints, is that all of this money that we're spending on the educational system, we're not really getting a very good return on investment, okay? So, I mean, we're, we're just throwing tons and tons of money at the public education system. And honestly, guys, it just seems to get worse and worse and worse, right? And that's one of the biggest complaints that people have. That's one of the reasons why schools like this exist. That's one of the biggest reasons why you have people that, that get into this national school choice argument. Because if you're going to be spending your tax dollars on something like education, there's a whole lot of people who are out there who think, you know what, I should get to choose how those tax dollars are spent, and I should get to choose what school I'm going to spend them at, okay? And so again, it's a really big deal, and, and so these are really complicated, right, and, and you know, just very deep issues that have multiple levels that you have to really think about in a very critical way in order to come up with reasonable and rational conclusions that are actually going to be workable, okay? And, and so, it, it's just, like I said, I mean, something so, so, as the school choice issue, right? It has to do with this discretionary spending of the federal government. And again, where does the federal government get the money? Well, they get that money primarily from your taxes, okay? And so, as a citizen who is paying those taxes, as far as I'm concerned, you fundamentally should have a right and you fundamentally have a say 
in exactly how those taxes get spent. And that's why it is so important to make sure who you're electing, especially to the congressional and the Senate level, right? That you're electing somebody who is going to represent you and give you the ability to actually have a say in how your tax dollars are spent. All right, guys? This is a, it's a really big deal. The rest, <clears throat> sorry. In addition, this part of the budget pays the salaries of all the people who work for the government. This includes the members of Congress, FBI agents, CIA agents, file clerks, and other government workers. Okay, so all the members of Congress, all the members of the Senate, the President, anybody who are the, the, uh, the, the members of the Supreme Court, other members of the, the federal judicial system, they are all being paid by our tax dollars. Okay. This is why, again, it's a big deal. This is why you have so many people out there who want to have a, a, a really, you know, influential say in how this money is spent. It's because it's coming from us. It is coming from the tax dollars that you pay into the Internal Revenue Service. And and honestly, I, I agree completely that we should have a say and be able to look at and see if that money is being spent in a wise way. Okay, Some federal money is given to state and local governments. For example, state and federal governments share the costs of some programs, including Medicaid. They also work together on projects like highway construction, employment training, and low-income housing. In the pie chart below and on the next page, you can see how the federal government gets, it, gets and spends its money. Okay, so we're going to go ahead we're going to take a look at this. Okay, So if we look at this here... Right, this biggest chunk of the pie graph, right? If we look at this, this, is the budget in 2002. Okay, so this is the revenue. This is where the money is coming from. This is the money that is coming into the federal government. Okay, this biggest chunk, like it's not quite, but you know, I'd say probably 47. Oh, well, hey, 49.2 percent. That's pretty close, just eyeballing it. <laughs> Okay. But this biggest chunk, right, this comes from individual income tax, right? This next biggest chunk, that comes from your social, social insurance and contributions. Remember the FICA taxes? We talked about that last week. So when you combine the individual income tax with your FICA taxes, that accounts for, so we got 33.1 and 49.2. If we were to add those two together, okay, that's going to give us a grand total of 82.3, 82.3% of federal revenue, the money that comes into the federal government, 82.3% comes from you, it comes from me, it comes from our FICA taxes, and it comes from our our individual income taxes, 82.3%, okay? That's where by far the majority of the money that goes to the federal government comes from. It comes from the citizens. Therefore, I believe it makes sense that the citizens should have a say in exactly how that money is spent, and we should be holding our governors, or, or those who are govern, governing over us, when I say governors, I don't mean, like Mr. DeSantis, I don't mean our governor of the state, when I'm talking about those who govern us, okay, our legislatures, okay, the congressmen, the senate, the senators, the judicial system, we should hold them accountable for how they are spending this 82% of the money that they bring in. The next one, right, the next grace is corporate income tax. So that's even greater. So if you factor in, factor in corporate income tax, which again, that comes from us because corporations, corporations are not just these robotic systems that operate on their own, right? Corporations are made up of individuals. They are made up of citizens, okay? And so those corporations, they pay an additional 10%. So if we add that, that's 92%, 92%. Of all the money that the federal government get is coming from taxes from the citizenry. Okay, that means that the citizens of this country are paying 92% of the money the government uses every year from their taxes. Okay, so again, we should be able to have a say in how this money is spent, and we really should be able to really hold those people who are spending it 
accountable for the way that they spend it. Okay, then the rest of it comes from excise taxes and excise tax. Um, if you've heard, you know, some of the debate that's gone on when, when President Trump is talking about um, tariffs and uh, making sure that we have a, a good deal and we're getting a fair deal with the tariffs that, that are being paid, those are excise taxes. Taxes. Those are the taxes that are levied on um, different goods and services that are coming into the United States from other countries. They right. They do have to pay a tax to send their products here. They have to pay a tax to do business here. And so that falls in to this 3.4% right, of the, the tax pie. The next comes from estate and gift taxes. It's only 1.3%. Then you have custom duties. So again, custom duties, that's kind of an additional tax on the top of those excise taxes that, that is paid when certain goods enter the country. I'm sure if you've ever ordered anything, you know, with, with the internet now, right, and you're ordering something, you've ever ordered something from another country, right, it has to go through customs. Well, when it, the part of customs is being able to collect a certain percentage of tax for the objects that are coming in from another country, that would fall into this 1% category of customs and duties, okay? Then the rest of it, you have miscellaneous 2%. So those are going to be just different ways that the government brings in money. Let's say that maybe the government owns some land um, and like uh, there's maybe minerals or something on that. There could be companies that are mining the minerals, companies that are using that land and they're actually paying the government rent. Um, those kinds of things would fall into this miscellaneous category. Okay. So now if we look at that, right, this was the money that comes in. This is where the money comes from. This chart is the federal budget in 2002 for spending, how the money was spent. So again, the biggest chunk of the pie, do you see it? Social Security, 23.2%, by far the biggest chunk of the pie. The next chunk, 16.3%, is National Defense. The next chunk after that is going to be Income Security, so those are going to be different programs that honestly are probably tied to Social Security, like unemployment benefits. Okay, um, Again, a big issue that a lot of people are facing right now with the virus stuff that's going on. Um, that, that income security or that unemployment insurance, those unemployment benefits that people get, that falls into this category. Next is going to be Medicare at 11.7%. Healthcare, so that'd be like just any kind of federal dollars that go to any kind of hospitals that go to like the CDC, um, uh, help the Department of Health and Human Services, different things like that. That's where that spending goes to. Then we have we're paying interest on our debt. Nine point six percent of the money gets paid to the interest on the debt. Only three point nine percent of the budget overall goes to education, training, and social services. Okay, but even though it's only 3.9%, it's a lot of money. Okay, next 2.8% would be transportation, so that'd be money that's spent on things like roads, bridges, um, highways, trains. Um, honestly, um, some airlines actually receive um, government offsets and government money, um, depending upon the the types of planes that they build and different things like that. That would be in the transportation budget, but but it budget. <laughs> then you have the veterans benefits. And that's something that's good. So anybody who's been a soldier, somebody who has served in our armed forces, um, there are benefits that they get, right? So there's things like the VA, like that's the Veterans Administration. They have Veterans Administration hospitals or the VA hospitals, <clears throat> different things that veterans can take advantage of and, and get services kind of as a reward for serving their country, either in the military or one way or the other. Okay, so that would come from that pie. Administration of justice, again, it's going to go into like the federal prison system, paying for the guards, paying for the FBI. My guess is the CIA would probably be in that, but then again, the CIA is probably also going to be in some of the defense spending budget. Um, then we have natural resources and environment. That's going to go to things like the federal park system. Uh, and different things like that. Uh, then you have general science, space, and technology. So that would be things like NASA. Um, 
and just general technological and scientific advancement. So if the government gives grants, right, to a scientist or gives grants to a particular university um, or a professor, that's where that money would come from, okay? So that is your unit on 5.2, or I mean, you, chapter 5, section 2, um, looking at government spending. So again, it makes sense. Last week we talked about taxes. As we could see from this graph, again, 92% of all of the income that the, the government receives comes from income-based taxes, right? Whether that be your FICA taxes, corporation taxes, or individual tax, um, and then we have the way that that money is spent, right? And so it's just really good to remember all the goods, all the services, all the different things that you take advantage of as a citizen of the United States are almost exclusively paid for through taxes. Okay, guys? Now, make sure, like I said, you need to write down all of your vocabulary words. Make sure you write them down. And then you need to answer the section review questions on page 57, make sure you answer these questions with a good, complete sentence. They must be answered with complete sentences. Okay, guys? Other than that, that's your economics lesson. Uh, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and uh, I'll talk to you later.